So good evening. Uh, my name is Chris Stone. I'm the president of the Open Society Foundations, and it is a great pleasure to be with all of you and with Ethan Zuckerman here this evening. Um, uh, our plan is that uh, uh, Ethan and I are going to have a, um, a, a conversation for a few minutes as we start, try and get some uh, thoughts, uh, some ideas, um, uh, maybe a debate or two going uh, here, and then we will, as uh, uh, turn this uh, open, um, invite your own comments, questions, um, contributions. We have a few from uh, the net already, and there may be additional ones coming in. Um, and we will um, we will wrap up uh, pretty promptly at about 7:30 uh, here in New York, um, about uh, about 90 minutes from now. Um, the uh, um, I first uh, met Ethan um, when I was uh, on the faculty at at the Harvard Kennedy School, and running uh, had just started uh, as faculty director of the Hauser Center for Nonprofit Organizations. Ethan, um, I think then was formerly with the Ber with the Berkman Center, um, and uh, uh, we were having a discussion about. Um, the fate of news media in the world um, and the relationship between what was happening with the internet and the quality of global journalism. And uh, I learned a lot of things in that meeting. Um, it was my first serious discussion at the Berkman Center. It was my first uh, serious discussion with uh, really good web jockeys, a term I learned during that meeting and I think we need to introduce uh, here at the Open Society Foundations. Um, and. Uh, but I also learned um, something about the extraordinary uh, way that Ethan Zuckerman thinks and talks, and now I've learned also writes about these questions. Um, he touches in the book on some of the issues of that conversation about um, what's happened to international news. Um, but here in this book, unlike that conversation, which was really about the news industry, here it's really about its impact on all of us um, and how um, in some ways, uh, within a world where we have more access to more information than we've ever had before, we know less than we've ever known before, um, or at least it's harder uh, to figure out how to learn about particularly international events, or more precisely, events farther away from us, uh, from, our, um, from what we think we want to know. Um, the book, um, uh, Ethan is now um, the director of the um, uh, of the MIT's Center on Civic Media as part of the Media Lab uh, at, uh, at MIT. Um, he is also a member of our global board um, of the Open Society Foundations um, and has just uh, finishing a stint um, uh, uh, in the next year, I think, on the Information Programs Board. He has been a tremendous uh, guide for all of us, I think, here at the Foundations. Um, and it's wonderful to see uh, this book now in print and getting the attention it is. Um, the book is, uh, if you haven't had a chance to read it, it's a great read. Um, I puzzled over exactly who you thought you were writing for as, you, as I read the book. Me too. It's, uh, it's full of engaging stories, um, uh, everything from... Um, uh, how Pablo Picasso came to, uh, to appreciate African art, um, to the SARS epidemic, uh, uh, to uh, a, a, some real insight into how um, Ethan's own project, Global Voices, um, is trying to um, enact some of the solutions to the problems that he diagnoses in the book. Um, but it is, above all, um, a, a series of stories tied together by a concern um, for um, who we are as human beings, how we connect with each other, understand each other, and seems, uh, although it never quite uh, makes, the, um, makes the claim, seems to be um, a manifesto uh, for a deep humanitarian connection, a, a deep uh, appreciation of difference, of diversity, of strangeness, of newness, um, and of a creative imagination fired by all of that. Um, it is, a, um, and I am, uh, Ethan was telling me before we started today uh, that he, um, that his first job 
um, in tech uh, was, uh, was helping uh, people in the neighborhood set up their Apple IIs. He was about nine at the time. Um, and, uh, um, and he's one of the, we all know that person who somehow in our circle of friends or our neighborhood or our workplace actually knew how to make these new machines work. Um, and whether it was helping neighbors set them up or 10 years later helping his professors figure out um, how to do desktop layout of the books. They weren't quite yet famous enough to get Norton to do the layout for. Um, uh, 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 Ethan, Ethan was someone who could make the internet uh, work and, and make uh, computers before the internet work, um, work for all of us. Um, and I just wanted, I thought uh, I'd start by just asking you, <laughs> how come, you know, how do you get from this kind of techie um, start um, to the philosophical stance, or the real, um, this manifesto about humanity, um, deep in scholarship, uh, you, you, you treat Appiah's work on cosmopolitanism um, with the seriousness and respect and engagement of a, of a real peer. Um, uh, that is, I think, uh, a long way from where you started in this tech world. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm curious how you, about your journey as well as the, uh, the work you've done. Well, Chris, thank you so much. And um, <clears throat> it's really wonderful to be here. I, I, one of the perhaps not clearly enough acknowledged parts of this book is that uh, a lot of the exploration I've been privileged to do over the last decade and sort of understanding where people around the world are using technology to share their stories is work that I've done in the context of Open Society Foundation. So it seems very appropriate to have the chance to, to come and do this here. Um, there is a sense in which um, this book is a love letter. And it's a love letter to the world of technology. And it's the love letter of, of a frustrated lover who sort of worked through the initial disappointment and is now sort of going on to resolution that we're going to stay married and we're going to work it out over time. So the, the, where the analogy comes in is that, like most people who got fascinated by technology at a young age, I took a lot of the sort of cyber utopian promises very much at face value and was an early Wired magazine reader, you know, was sort of following the internet explosion, was very much part of that whole movement, um, and bought to one extent or another this really fierce hope uh, that John Perry Barlow and Kevin Kelly and a lot of early net proponents had that the internet would be a, a great leveler of one fashion or another. It would really bring us into a cosmopolitan future where it was far easier to get information from different parts of the world. And I took this idea seriously enough that I decided to actually sort of go out and give it a try. So uh, after I got done typesetting professors' books, um, my first serious tech entrepreneurial job was one of those sort of classic internet 1.0 jobs, top floor of an old cable mill, startup run by people in shorts with long hair all in their 20s. Uh, and it was actually a very successful company. And I came out of that with enough ability to sort of buy my own time and decided to found a nonprofit, uh, founded a nonprofit called Geek Corps, uh, designed with the, the humble aim of bringing the Peace Corps up to date. I felt that it was very silly that Americans should be out uh, teaching poor people how to farm because most of us in America don't know a ton about farming and that maybe we should teach some of the stuff that we actually know about. And so I was working in Ghana, West Africa, a country that I'd, I'd studied in previously, um, trying to help small companies, small IT companies, get off the ground and really market to sort of a global audience. And this, this isn't quite as crazy as it sounds. Um, this was uh, the year 2000. Actually, there was a Ghanaian company at that point um, that was entering the data for New York City parking tickets. So if you got a ticket in New York City, it would be scrawled by a patrol person, and it would be taken, and it would be photographed. The photo would be shipped to Ghana, and some Ghanaian sitting at a desk in an air-conditioned office would have to figure out the handwriting and enter it in so you would actually have a database of, of parking records. Um, and this looked like such a great idea. Like, how can we start taking jobs that people didn't really want to do in the U.S.? Could we do them in a place like Ghana? And so I started working with those firms, and I had volunteers on the ground working with half a dozen Ghanaian tech firms sort of trying to get them off the ground. 
And I was really gung-ho on the potential of Ghana and Sub-Saharan Africa as a whole to turn the corner and sort of join the global economy. And we had an election in 2000, we had an election in the U.S., you may remember, not a particularly good one, not one of our shining moments. Ghana had a really great election in 2000, like as good as it gets, opposition leader comes, takes power, peaceful election, smooth transition of government. Ghana's ambassador to the U.S., good friend of mine at this point, shows me the letter that he sent to Bill Clinton offering Ghanaian election observers to come and oversee the Florida recount. I mean, that kind of election. And, and, and for me, just the heart of this sort of Africa rising narrative. And so I'm at home. I'm at home for the holidays. I'm waiting on December 30th, 2000, to see how a peaceful transfer of power in Africa is portrayed in the New York Times. And it's not on the front page, and it's not on the inside page. And several pages in, I find 237 words acknowledging that Ghana had an election and that it wasn't a massacre. And at that point, I sort of realized that, that my hopes for technology as this great leveler were probably in the wrong place. And that I might know an awful lot about the World Wide Web, and I did in 2000. Um, but to go after the issues that I really cared about, that I really cared about this question of what we would know was going on in other parts of the world, that that wasn't a technical question. That was a question about media. It was a question about attention. And that's what really got me to, to, to work on this book. Th this book, in a nutshell, looks at that question of how the Internet is changing what we pay attention to. And it basically makes the case that the internet is a homophily machine. It's a machine that makes it very, very easy to pay attention to the people that we are similar to. Um, so we already know we have a tendency of birds of a feather to flock together. The internet makes it even easier to do that and to structure your information flows around it. But my hope is I don't stop with the jilted lover and just sort of stop there. I then try to go ahead and say it doesn't have to be that way, which is ultimately why I called the book Rewire, around the hopes that we would find a way to take this challenge head on and really use this, this technology for the potential it has to give us that very wide global view of the world. Terrific. The, um, the, uh... the, the book um, um, makes the claim, uh, af after demonstrating story after story after story why the internet doesn't actually solve our problems uh, by just connecting people. Um, you do say we just, we have to rewire. Um, and by that, um, at least as I read it, you, you mean that the, that the internet is a, the internet makes a lot possible, but we've built a series of tools and we use them in ways and our ambitions in some ways are stunted with those tools that we aren't, um, we, not only are we not taking advantage of the internet, we're not going to take advantage of the internet unless we change something fundamental, not just about our intentions, but about the tools we use and how we, how we engage with the, with the internet. And the case is, um, the case is a lovely um, halfway point between, I think, what you describe as the cyber skeptics and the, um, the cyber utopians. And I'm delighted that you've rescued utopianism um, uh, uh, there's a, um, uh, from, from the notion of it's completely, uh, uh, of just false gods, um, but actually uh, ambitions sometimes worthy of pursuit, but requiring a kind of discipline and a hard-headedness and not just a, uh, a hope it will happen automatically. Um, so, and uh, there are, along the way, for those who, uh, Part of what's fun about the book is actually not the stories you tell, but some of the asides, I think, through it. There's a wonderful, um, uh, the, Ethan's description at, in one, at one moment about what he calls thoughtful cynicism. I now have a name for what I think of, <laughs> I'd like to think of myself as, a really thoughtful, um, a cynical person. And the, uh, um, it's a way of fixing utopianism. And, um, and I also particularly like your notion of, of looking for the conspiracy-free explanations of things because in a world so interested in conspiracy theories. But I think both of those actually point to your commitment here to try and understand the flaws in the tools, not how someone is using them to distort us, whether it's a government or a company. Um, it's really not about blaming others. It's really about trying to understand what we ourselves are not taking advantage of 
uh, and how we're doing it. Um, well, you, well, before we before we go further, why don't you say something about what you think the solutions are? You have a, uh, some sure. examples sure. of some of those, but what do you want us? What do we do if we uh, agree with you in the first half of the right. book or first third? What do we do about it? Well, so so let's start by by taking a look at one of those tools, and and one of the tools that I really beat up on, and I beat up on it in part because it's important and in part because I love it as well as hate it, uh, but the tool is Facebook. And, and Facebook really became sort of the dominant social network as I was writing this book. And it strikes me that there's an enormous contradiction between what Facebook is and what Facebook likes to portray itself as being. So uh, in 2010, uh, there was a, a, a summer intern at, at Facebook, a kid named Paul Butler, um, who got access to the core data set of Facebook, which is the social graph. Who is friends with whom? And this is the, the very essence of, of, of the, the, this is Facebook's most valuable property. And he got access to enough of it that he was able to make a map. Uh, and the map is, is pretty extraordinary. It's a lovely piece of graphic design. It's a map of the world made out of glowing blue light. And all the blue lines are all the international connections of everybody on Facebook. And this image has become so important to Facebook that you'll see Zuckerberg use it in almost all of his press appearances. So recently, Zuckerberg has been doing a lot of things about his plans for internet in the developing world. And you'll see him standing in front of a, a giant monitor with this glowing map of Facebook connecting the world. And it's very clear that, that that's how he thinks of, of the site. And the map is, is, is garbage. It's, it's a complete misrepresentation of what the network actually is. The average Facebook user has 130 friends. The vast majority are people that you know in the offline world, 92% are people that you know offline. And in fact, Facebook is very suspicious of you making friends purely online. It assumes that if you're making friends purely online, you're probably marketing or spamming. So it actually asks you, do you know this person in real life? Because it's one of their anti-fraud algorithms. And when you join Facebook, what they try to do is replicate your offline network. They ask for who you went to high school with, who you went to college with, who you've worked with. They try to reconstruct all of this. Now, there's the paranoid version of this, and I appreciate you bringing out this question of, of paranoia versus the sort of Occam's razor explanation. The paranoid version is that, is that Facebook really wants to give the NSA a run for its money. It wants to have as thorough an understanding of your social network so that it can market to you, et cetera. The real answer behind this is that Facebook is designed to be a warm bath. It's designed to be this wonderful, comfortable, supportive space where you come in and your old friends tell you what's going on and they give you emotional support and you stay there again and again and again because you keep clicking and you keep seeing ads. And one of the first questions is to say, could you imagine a Facebook that worked differently? So one way to imagine a Facebook that worked differently is one that isn't necessarily about connecting you to the old friends. It might be about introducing you to new friends. And that would be a Facebook that starts by saying, what are you interested in? What do you want to know about? And that's a Facebook that would then take the topic or it would take the informational piece of it and then say, can I introduce you to some people that you know and also to some people who you don't know who might be deeply interesting to you? Now, would it work as well as an ad vehicle? No, definitely not. It would be far more challenging. It would be far more likely to make you uncomfortable in one fashion or another. It would have a much higher degree of risk. And ultimately, at the heart of this, my, my fear is that the internet, which was a very risky place in the 1990s, you really didn't know what you were going to get, has had the risk sort of systematically wrung out of it, mostly by the advertising industry that advertising needs you not to be discomfited, needs you not to click to the other page. And in the process, we've lost a lot of what we hoped the internet would do, which is deliver us cognitive diversity, give us that ability to see other perspectives, other ways of solving problems, other ways of framing issues. So for me, where I would go after solving this, the first thing that I would do is when I look at a tool like Facebook, I would try to understand what are those assumptions. What was that built around? And then how does it change if you start shifting those assumptions somewhat? And the answer may, it changes into something that isn't worth many billions of dollars. It simply is an interesting cognitive experiment. 
But there are ways that you can push and sort of say, can you make that an option? The other things that I think you absolutely have to look at are these questions about what are the remaining barriers between human connection. So there's a chapter in the book that talks about translation, which doesn't get talked about enough, but remains a giant unsolved problem in an internet age. You go to Google and you look for a piece of information. The piece of information you may need may be in French. Google is not going to give you that information. They are simply going to assume that it's linguistically locked to you. So trying to get through translation, trying to get through cultural bridging, which is a the main theme of the book, trying to get through new ways of discovery. How do you discover information that may not have been initially what you were looking for, but gives you that new perspective, that experience of serendipity, that experience of an alternative perspective on something? Much of the book looks at what, what seem like sort of absurd ideas, but could you actually go ahead and engineer serendipity? And I think the answer is, I, I actually think you can make some steps towards it, but you have to start from this assumption that these tools that we have were not somehow descended from heaven. They were written by overweight, long-haired guys like me who were trying to make a buck in the venture capital market. And as a result, they were made with certain assumptions and not with other assumptions. I'm tempted to, I'm tempted to go down the road of, of whether we get serendipity because we want it or because it's available. And a lot of the, a lot of the book uh, moves into that. But I wanna, I'm going to open it up for questions. But I want to ask one, one, one more before we, before we go. And, it's a, and it may be a little unfair because it doesn't, it's, it doesn't, really, it doesn't just ask you to, um, to tell a story from the book, but to think about your current environment and where you and I first met at a university. Because in some ways, um, the problem you're dealing with, the problem of people who don't yet either have the confidence to embrace a cosmopolitan impulse um, or haven't yet learned the pleasures of cosmopolitanism, um, a lot of the role of the university is about um, instilling and reproducing and deepening those impulses. Um, and these days, universities are obsessed with trying to figure out how to use the internet to do their core work, to teach, to link students across campuses, to attract more students to pay tuition at their campus, um, or in their, at least to their accounts, even if they never touch their campus. Um, the, the fascination with the internet as a way of moving to the next version of the university, I don't know, university 6.0 or something, um, is, uh, is really, it, it's interesting both because um, it's the place you'd think that ambition would be strong, and the conversation seems some of the weakest conversation about how to use the internet. The tools are some of the crudest, the ideas some of the least imaginative, and as a result, the use of the internet by universities is, is rather shallow. Might we rewire, what would it mean to rewire the way universities are thinking about using the net to, to achieve exactly the kind of ambition uh, that you want here? Well, so, one of the ideas that I, that I do explore in the book is the question of universities as a space for social engineering, which they most certainly are. And there's a wonderful study done on Facebook usage at a large, prominent American university that happened to be an extremely early adopter of Facebook, and you can figure out from there which university it is. But what they figure out at this university is basically that this problem of homophily, this problem of flocking together, is so much worse than anyone had ever imagined. And they figure this out by, by analyzing Facebook. And they basically say, ignore friends, right? You know, I'll friend everybody in the room because that's what we do on Facebook. Look for photographic co-presence. If I'm in a photo with my arm around you, we're probably friends. And we can build a tie on that. And when you look at that social network, you find out that it's not just that Asian American kids hang out with other Asian American kids. Vietnamese kids hang out with Vietnamese kids. Filipino kids hang out with Filipino kids. It, it's, it's small groups all the way down. Math majors from Michigan hang out with math majors from Michigan. The one piece of good news that comes out of this for people who are interested in this question of how we build bridges, which is a, really the heart of the book, um, is that people become friends with their roommates. And this university is really, really good about making sure that you don't room with someone particularly similar. 
And so you basically end up with people who have these social circles where they have one friend who is their bridge into a community of a different identity of one fashion or another, which gives them sort of a very complicated anchor as they sort of move through that space. And it's very, very clear that this is how the university sets up its housing system, wants to make sure that this is a key part of your education in that first year that you're there. Now, when we get to the question of what do universities do online, they basically forget that a huge chunk of what universities do is try to educate the whole person and to try to give you that diverse, broad range. Universities suddenly think of themselves as purveyors of a product. So I teach at MIT. MIT is one of the leaders in this space. We have a platform called edX. And we appear to be convinced that all we really need to do to provide an MIT education is to take a statistics lecture, put it online, and build a really, really good system for grading worksheets. And this is the sort of thing that pretty much gives faculty apoplexy because they sort of look at this. We recently had the president of the university come to a faculty meeting and, and offer a provocation, not an announcement, but a provocation, which was, look, educating undergrads is really expensive. What if we made a year of MIT virtual? What if we just did freshman year wholly online? And, and once you cut through the sort of immediate emotional reactions of, oh my God, you're destroying the university as I know it, there are these really deep questions. Would you suddenly have students coming in in their sophomore year capable of dealing with the academic load, but with none of that sort of interpersonal experience that students actually get out of that first year? And, and my sense is that you'd basically be, be kicking problems down the road. The, the students who have problems at freshmen, it isn't that they can't handle the statistics homework. It's that they're going through that growth experience of sort of coming to a university. How do you solve this? I think you look at education in a, in a much deeper and more nuanced way. We're doing a, a class right now at, at the Media Lab um, uh, called Media Lab X, which is very much a, a, a riff on edX and sort of saying, if edX is about taking a lecture class and putting it online, how do we do what we do at the Media Lab? We do no lecture classes. There are none. We only do project and peer-based learning. So how do you do project and peer-based learning online? Well, pretty quickly, you run into these questions about interaction, cultural translation, power. I have two groups of students working on a question that we're calling symmetric learning, which is to say, is there a way that people can have a learning experience where my job isn't to teach you and your job is to learn, but there's some genuine exchange going in both ways. And, and can you do this in a context where there's a big cultural gap? And so we're trying to do this between the iHub in Nairobi, which is probably the most interesting tech incubator in sub-Saharan Africa at the moment, which has about 5,000 sort of amazing Kenyan developers and entrepreneurs and the Media Lab, which is a pretty amazing place in its own right. And we're bumping into all of this stuff very, very early on. It turns out that the net makes it possible for us to sort of build these mashups. We can create a Google Hangout, put four Kenyan entrepreneurs, put four American grad students into it at the same time. But we have very, very little experience in sort of figuring out how do we make that helpful, supportive, fair, usable. and and. Where I'm going on this book more than anything else is to sort of say, look, this is going to happen whether we like it or not. You know, and it may only happen at the edges. It may only happen at the folks who are really daring to sort of go out and work across cultural borders. If we're lucky, maybe it really happens on a broad scale because I think we need that level of interaction and introduction. But we really need some help getting through it. And, and the, the three or four ideas that I'm putting forward as first steps are just first steps. We really, really need people who can help us go further on all of this. So I'm going to translate that as uh, if, if you do your freshman year online, you need an online roommate, and it should be somebody on a different continent than you. Um, and you need at least one screaming fight with that person, and at least <laughs> one of you needs to move out and like sleep on the quad in the middle of the night. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. I may be extrapolating from my own experience. Let's, uh, let's see. Um, questions, comments? Uh, um, now we're going to have a microphone How challenged wanna, here. Why don't you, are, are, why don't are, you are, stay that and you're, I will, you're, you're, I will you're wander around. Yes, All right. Exactly. I'm honored. Go. I'm honored. Just introduce yourself. Uh, you're, you're, uh, this as well. 
Uh, Malcolm Arnold, uh, thank you very much. I'm just curious to what extent um, have you been influenced or know of the thinking of Adam Curtis and his documentaries uh, dealing with the Internet, et cetera, and dealing with some of the issues that you're dealing with? I, I, I don't know them. I'm, I'm sorry. Do you want to tell me a little bit about them? Um, he did, uh, he's done several documentaries um, in England, BBC. Um, he's done uh, one, All Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace, which is um, a take on the uh, on the poem, yep. uh, early you know, early days of the internet, and um, he talks about uh, the utopianism and uh, Ayn Rand, you know, Rand Foundation, um, where technology was going to take it. And in that one documentary, uh, he takes it uh, through there, and then through his other documentaries, he he talks about advertising and the connection with advertising. So I highly recommend uh, checking them out. Uh, I appreciate the recommendation. Since I since I don't know them, it's a little hard for me uh, to to riff on. Uh, I I will say that certainly my hope in this was to look back at some of the rhetoric of the 1990s internet, uh, which very much came out of a sense in which internet institutions would replace real world institutions, where we would have the ability to sort of create things from scratch and. I think we've all sort of figured out the, the problems with that, that, that essentially um, the Internet hasn't magically solved some of the toughest problems with institution building, particularly um, how groups of people get together, make decisions, get along with one another. Um, and so there's been a lot of big promises that have been very disappointing. It doesn't mean that those core ideas aren't interesting and aren't worth exploring. And so part of what I was sort of trying to do with this book was to sort of head off a, a, a real intellectual tendency at the moment, which is a, a, an anti-internet backlash, which basically says, um, you know, you guys are obsessed with this. It's the only solution, the only place where interesting things are going on. And, and a ton of that critique is right. Um, where that critique is wrong is to sort of leave off at that moment and essentially say, people who are looking to the internet to sort of naturally solve problems uh, are almost certainly making a terrible mistake. People who then say the internet is no help to us in solving big deep problems are also almost certainly making a mistake. It's incredibly helpful to be able to coordinate large groups of people at very, very low cost. It's incredibly helpful to let people create and disseminate media and be able to share it over great distances at almost no cost. What we don't really know yet is how to harness that into the really big social issues we're playing about. And so for me, the question becomes, how do you put those social issues onto the table? And particularly, how do you put them onto the table for the people who are actually sort of building these tools? One of the critiques that I've gotten a lot in having this book out there is that people are arguing that I'm, I'm far too optimistic. Someone described me uh, as, as believing that Google was in fact the Archangel Gabriel. And, and I, in my own defense, I actually am somewhat more cynical that, that I may come out on all of this, but I need those guys to take these ideas seriously. Uh, I've watched for 20 years people try to build alternative political structures, alternative social structures, just blessed by the internet, and have sort of come to the conclusion that there's really big, powerful companies that have an enormous amount of influence on what we see and what we don't see. And I would rather get them sort of thinking about these questions and have it influencing their work than simply point my finger and sort of say, you guys have blown it so far. So that, that's really been my way of, of trying to go after the, the utopian stance. And I'm, I'm sorry that I don't know the, the works that you're talking about. Hi, I'm Avery Hudson. Um, and I hope I understood you correctly when you define uh, internet as we have it now as a homophony machine. Homophily. 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 Okay. Homophily is is the the tendency of birds of a feather to flock together. It's one of those great one dollar sociology words, but it's actually really helpful. Okay, close enough. Um, because I'm thinking, since we're here at the Open Society Foundations, I'm thinking that. This is a classic example of a closed society. Um, and of course, I then start thinking about this in context of Karl Popper's critique of the utopian project overall. 
And then I'm very interested in your focus on Facebook, um, which the business model is essentially monetizing friendships as you know, and the notorious quote from Mark Zuckerberg is, they trust me, but there are secrets, the dumb fucks. Um, so I, I would just like ask you, and it's, perhaps it's in your book, which I can't wait to read, what would a vision of the internet look like that's divorced from the utopian project? Well, so uh, first of all, your observation that uh, we're creating our own self-sorting group together in this room, I, I think is absolutely right on. And uh, in some ways, my, my favorite um, critique of the book so far was someone who started asking over Twitter um, why I'd had the five people on the back of the book jacket blurb the book. And, and this person knows me well enough to know that I know all five of those people well, and that those five people are very, very well known in, in what one might call the internet intellectuals circle but are probably wholly unknown outside of that circle. And so the person's critique was, if the whole point of a book blurb is to get people who don't know you to read your book, you failed utterly. You've basically just shown your credentials as being sort of part of this set, and those credentials are totally opaque to anybody outside of this set. So, you know, what were you thinking? Uh, and, and since my editor at, at Norton and I have a, a, a very Twitter-centric relationship, I wrote to my editor and I sort of said, look, I think he's got a point, you know, did, did we blow it? At which point my editor came back and said, but that, that's the whole cost of these things. Like, you know, reviewing a book it is a non-zero cost. I reviewed one on the plane flight over from Berlin on my way over here. And, you know, it takes some serious time to sort of sit down and write that blurb. So obviously you're going to make those sort of demands on your webs of friends. So I don't think there's a vision of the internet that is independent of friendships. I don't even know that there's a reasonable vision of the internet right now that is independent of monetized friendships. I just think it's too easy and too obvious and sort of a way to go on it. Where I am, I, I think perhaps nostalgically looking back as well as sort of looking forward, is the internet that I sort of fell in love with in the late 1980s and early 1990s um, <clears throat> was basically an internet of self-selected weirdos with very diverse interests and diverse geography. So on, on one axis, it was a much more diverse set of interactions than you tend to have today. You would go into a conversation about photography, and the most knowledgeable person might well be in Finland or might well be in Japan. And that sort of topic-organized internet was quite diverse in terms of geography. Now, my friend Judith Donath pointed out when I started using this example that it probably wasn't very diverse in terms of people's occupations. It was all graduate students. That's what the internet was in, in, in the late 1980s. And in that sense, you probably actually have more socioeconomic diversity by being in touch with your high school friends on Facebook. Um, certainly when I look to see how many Republicans there are in my social orbit, that's where I'm sort of having that encounter. And it's probably very useful for my cognitive diversity. I think we've just spent 10 years building an internet very, very good at monetizing friendship. We use friendship for recommendation. We use friendship for endorsement. We use friendship to sort of make us comfortable with what we're seeing online. I would love to see 10 years of work as hard around these questions of sort of curiosity, interest in a topic, and sort of the diversity that comes out of that. And I really think that there's actually enormous economic potential around this. I think we're starting to hit the limits of going into Facebook and saying, find me a restaurant in New York City that my friends like. And, and it's a solution to one small set of problems. But there's another set of problems where the solution is, find me something that's going to help me understand what's going on in the Congo written by someone that I don't know, but has enough in common with me that I'm going to be able to actually understand what it's about. And that's a really different set of questions than the questions we've been asking now. You know, for me, that starts getting closer to where we want to go. Now, whether it gets us away from Popperian utopianism, I don't know if I just shrugged off that entire part of the question, but that's what I got for you. <laughs> Let's go back here. I'm going to go back, and then we'll come back over here. Hi, my name is Alan Kritzler. I've just retired from an inspector general's office. 
And um, uh, I haven't read your book. I'm familiar with a lot of issues, of, uh, most recently going to a lot of uh, forums on big data and surveillance, and uh, not by accident. And uh, uh, and to be honest, I, uh, I can only judge from this presentation, but that, uh, that you have presented something where any uh, aspect anyone would bring up, which is not positive, will be labeled conspiratorial and, and, and other negative things. So let me bring those up. And uh, there's an excellent film uh, uh, I think it's called uh, Check Check the Box Below, about uh, one aspect of the internet where everything you sign on to collects minute information about you forever and sells it to anyone, any government, any spy agency uh, for any use. and. Thing. Yes, okay. Uh, uh, now, we find out that in a very, let's say, non-friendly way, the NSA has taken advantage of that uh, to deal with uh, unfortunate people like leaders of democratic countries and, uh, and use them in a very negative fashion. And what are you seeing as protections, both against corporate misuse of data and governmental misuse of data? So um, I apologize if, if somehow my comments so far have, have given you the impression that I am, first of all, uh, an unabashed internet enthusiast or that I'm not interested in the dark sides. Um, let me then say, to answer your direct question, which are what are the limits on, on corporate use and government use at present, there are none. None. And it, it's, it's a, a horrific situation. It's an utterly terrifying situation. And what's been particularly interesting about the NSA revelations is that they've made us, or some of us, not enough of us, very uncomfortable about the potential of metadata and we've been giving that stuff up for 15 years to corporate partners that have very explicitly said, we're going to build our businesses around this. So it's a really interesting moment. It's, it's actually kind of an interesting reflection on what Americans are and are not worried about. You, you'd like me to solve all of internet surveillance? I, could, can I finish my comment first? Ethan, so that, that isn't what my, my book's about. So I, I, I'm, I, I, Ethan, let me, let me ask you, let me, let me keep it going a little bit, because I think several of the questions are, are about the, um, are sort of pushing you on the deep flaws in the way the Internet has developed, the ability of various powerful forces to exploit those flaws. At least, as, at, I may be wrong, and maybe this is the utopian, not the cynical side of me, but um, at least... I think, that I think you're trying to make an argument um, in some of the same ways that we teach, or at least my, when my kids went to school here in New York City, the public schools were in a debate them about uh, learning, um, learning uh, syntax and vocabulary or learning what was called whole language. And the point about whole language was that it was trying to teach them at a very uh, young age, five, six, seven, that when they saw a book, when they got handed a textbook, that was a human product. Somebody had built that. Somebody had written that. It was a human being. Someone had published it, designed it, and they met. They didn't just read the book. They went down to the what was then the publishing <laughs> district in New York and met publishers and met authors. And it was not about the book. It was about it was about the book as a human product. And at least it seems to me part of your answer to the the questions about what do you do is the first step is to see the internet as a human product this and the tools the facebook's and the other tools on it that we built these and that means we could build other kinds of tools that might achieve other things i mean at least it seems to me that is I, I, part of the argument you're making sure look so it's not a book about surveillance in part because it was written well before snowden at all came out with 
the revelations and we understood the extent to which the government was looking at this information. It was very much written in an era where corporations were collecting and using this data. And I would hope that part of what's going on in the book is raising this question and essentially saying to the extent that we've built an internet right now designed to track individuals by corporations to better target to them, that there are enormous problems with that and that we need to start taking apart the assumptions behind those tools we make to push them in different directions. My goal here was not to undo the corporate surveillance state or the government surveillance state. And there are other people doing really good work on that, and I'm happy to sort of talk about it. Where there is sort of a parallel is this question of what are the assumptions that get built into it. The internet, when it was built, was built as a network with very, very little security built within it. It's required an enormous amount of work to sort of bolt security onto it after the fact. And the reason for that was that it was really designed as a space where people were going to be reading publications. And so when you build library security, you tend to build library security pretty sparsely. Uh, yes, at the end of the day, you really don't want people's patron records being released, but generally people don't design libraries the way that they design banks. So we took something that had been designed to be a library where it was very, very easy to publish and very, very easy to borrow, and we bolted on enough security that you could put your credit cards on it. But what we did not do is put enough security to really make it hard so that you couldn't be traced in the content that you were looking at. Now, we could think about how you rebuild that from the ground up. And there's lots of different ways to go about building that. You can try to make it cryptographically secure so you can't make a path between someone looking at a resource and, and who that person is. We've not done it for two reasons. One is that it's an enormous and heavy lift. It would be a very, very different internet than what we have built. The second is that people aren't asking for it. And this is an enormous problem. Now, sir, I already see you, you know, making faces at me, but I wish there were more people going out into the streets upset about the NSA, in part because I'm trying to get people out into the streets. How many people are on Facebook? How many people have gotten off of Facebook because they're worried about corporate surveillance on it? How many people are using meaningful security like Tor or PGP to do this? I'm trying to make the argument that there are millions and millions of people making what I agree with you are bad decisions. And I'm trying to figure out how we would actually get to the point where we would have that conversation about moving forward. I, I actually think I'm on your side on this, believe it or not. I, I, you're making it very hard for me to, to make that case, but let's uh, let's do some more. Thanks. Uh, hi, Micha Sifri from Personal Democracy Media. Ethan, great book. Um, I want to ask you, uh, you, you talk about homophily as the problem uh, that we're, the internet is a homophily machine. It's making it too easy to plot together narrowly. Um, but I think the the more serious concern for me is the destruction of attention that seems to be flowing in part from all this media. And, and you know, uh, we may flock together. We're not following anything with any attention. I have in front of me a, a chart that uh, Gilad Lotan made um, at Social Flow uh, that looks at trending topics on Twitter for a four-month period in 2012 across a bunch of American cities. And on the average day, anywhere from 500 to 1,000 topics trend. There's one day in March of 2012 where the number of trending topics is below 50. That's the day the Coney 2012 video came out, which you've written about as a very, very problematic example of the internet actually focusing us on something. And uh, I wonder if you would talk a bit about, you know, what can we do? I'm with you on yep. uh, heterophily. <laughs> but what about... <laughs> it's the opposite of homophily. I looked it up. It's on Wikipedia. Um, did, did you make the page while sitting here, Miha? No, it's there. It's actually, I didn't have to do a thing. And besides, there are too many male editors on Wikipedia already. Um, but 
I don't know if the word is anti-Philly, but what do we do about what I tend to call internet-assisted attention deficit disorder? So, um, so what you're pointing to is this incredible explosion of content and voices that have sort of come around now that it's possible for everyone to publish as well as to access content. And this is a really old problem, right? You know, Herbert Simon, the amazing, and I don't even have a noun for Simon because he did so many things in political science and economics and so on and so forth. He started warning us about attention scarcity because of the advent of the Xerox machine. So his fear was that with the ability to sort of copy things via Xerox, we were going to start drowning in easily created information. And so he started positing this notion of an attention economy and this sort of demand for attention. And I find a lot of the language that he uses about attention economy to be incredibly helpful. What people have found is in a world where there's so many things demanding attention, we fall back on very basic things. And the reason that homophily sort of comes into play is that if you, as my friend, say, hey, Ethan, I need you to pay attention to this, I'm actually likely to give you some of that attention. And so a lot of what we talk about as far as the virality of media, sort of the spread of things, is really basing itself on those very human patterns of paying attention to your friends, paying attention to your family, and sort of growing from there. What it's meant is that a lot of the ways in which people used to gatekeep attention have sort of fallen down. So you can no longer look at what are the 10 things on the front page of the New York Times and say, this is what we're going to talk about today. In, in a lucky day, maybe one or two of them will turn out to be the things that we talk about, but there might well be 50 or 500 other things that are out there. So my sense is that we're turning to the social networks, we're turning to the friends as a way of trying to deal with this just welter of noise. And we're sort of going, I know that I need to know something. At least if I know what my friends know, I can talk with them. And where I think we need to start thinking about is how do we make sure that there's a diversity of voices that you're sort of paying attention to there? Um, I haven't been using the term heterophily because it's an awful mouthful. I've been using cognitive diversity as a way of sort of thinking about how do you find a path through all this information that isn't just giving you the same perspectives again and again, is giving you some amount of variety in terms of who you're listening to and sort of who's setting your priorities. And I think in, in many ways, we're never going to fully get away from Dunbar's number. You know, Robin Dunbar sort of speculates that there's about 150 people we can really sort of maintain strong relationships with. I think the internet has stretched it somewhat, but I don't think it's, it's obviated it. And I think really where the challenge is, is now it's so easy to fill that sort of Dun Dunbar's number jar with the old high school friends and sort of the folks who, who continue to insist on demanding your attention, we need to be very conscious about getting some diversity within that set. We need Dunbar's term limits. Um, the, uh, can we, I want to go to the net for one, um, and then we'll uh, come back to the room. How can new, because I think this carries off right where you were, right what you were talking about, how can news organizations help to connect people globally, even if social networks don't? So news organizations are incredibly powerful attention brokers, even now. And, and this is one of the stuff that, uh, in, in the research we're doing at Center for Civic Media, we're trying to look at the ecosystem of news stories. So we just did a, a very big paper uh, coming out shortly on Trayvon Martin, and sort of trying to understand how the shooting of an unarmed black teen turned into a national conversation about race. Because there was no guarantee that it was going to. Uh, and in fact, what happens with that story is it's reported by two or three Orlando news outlets, and then it sort of disappears from view. It comes back due to a PR campaign that manages to get a story on CBS News and also onto Reuters. And from there, we see what people sort of refer to as the networks. Then we see the petitions. Then we see people demanding that we talk about the racial impact of it. But it's very likely that that story would not have turned into a national debate without broadcast media sort of being in play. So I think anyone who has a really big audience, whether that's a celebrity, whether that's a professional news organization, has the power to bring voices into the debate that we don't normally hear from, whether it's the voice, uh, the, the voice of a tragically slain young man 
or whether it's the voice of someone in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo going through the conflict in that country right now. I think the press has a particular responsibility because we can still say to the press with a straight face, you have a double bottom line here. You can't just sustain yourself fiscally. We need you to sustain yourself civically as well. And part of your job is to connect us with people in other parts of the world who can help us understand what's going on. Now, this is really hard. And news organizations are still trying to figure out how to navigate their way through it there's still this sort of assumption that we are dumb enough that we need it processed for us by someone in a news studio in the United States. But you can also see the hunger um, to have that voice from the ground. You can remember Salem Pox, the Iraqi blogger, and this was a, a very unusual Iraqi. This is an Iraqi who'd studied in Germany, had a lot of the cultural signifiers in common with an audience in the United States and an audience in Europe. But that hunger for that perspective from the ground, built up by media who really helped sort of amplify and, and introduce people to him, I think sort of shows where we might hope media ends up going on all of this. In, in Global Voices, in, the, in the, the journalism project we've been working on for about nine years, built on top of global citizen media, we've made the argument multiple times that we're trying to replace foreign correspondents with local correspondents. We're trying to get to the point where instead of having an American sort of parachute in for a week, two days, and tell a story, we're actually trying to get to know the people who are on the ground there and amplify and translate and sort of bridge those voices. And for me, that, that's the big hope from broadcast media at this point, is that to one extent or another, as we face sort of fiscal shortfalls, as we face the different challenges to the news industry, this can be a moment where those organizations say, maybe our job now is to find people in communities who can help us understand what's going on and who can do that bridging. Let's go. Hi, my name is Laura Reed. I work at Freedom House. I'm a researcher there for their Freedom on the Net publication. Um, and I just wanted to go back a little bit to um, things we were talking about earlier. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about Twitter in comparison to Facebook um, or other social media tools, because I feel like a lot of the things that you were saying about Facebook are actually different in the way that Twitter is set up and the way that people use Twitter. And I don't study Twitter as a platform. I just use it in my work. And I know that you know most of the people that follow me are my friends and people I know in real life. But most of the people that I follow, I don't know. And, um, you know, I, follow, I use it for work, so I follow people in the field, and I have, I feel like through Twitter, there's a much greater depth of information that I'm receiving versus breadth that I might have of diversity of viewpoints and things like that. But I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. And I guess I just wanted to kind of complicate this idea that you're presenting of homophily as being necessarily negative. And also to ask you just from your work if you have, you know, a broader picture of how people use Twitter as opposed to just my personal experience and how I use it. Yep. So, so the structures of Facebook versus Twitter are just a great example to sort of talk about the idea that, that I'm trying to bring forward, which is that all these tools have certain assumptions baked into them, right? So the assumptions behind Facebook are that relationships are symmetric. If, if I am following you, you are following me because we are friends and that represents a particular version of, of a friendship. On Twitter, I might decide that I'm interested in what you have to say. I can follow you. It's no cost to you. You don't have to pay any attention to me. You don't have to acknowledge me. It doesn't actually change my ability to reach you or talk to you unless you reciprocate that friendship. It's simply I'm paying attention to you and, and nothing else happens. And so the networks have evolved in very, very different ways. Facebook puts a fairly strong limit on how many people you're following. As a result, most people end up following people that they know in the real world. Twitter has some of that. Certainly, if you look at the geography of Twitter, it turns out to be closer to sort of 70% having geographic locality. So there's nice work done by Barry Wellman and his students at University of Toronto that looks at the sort of geographic path of Twitter. And it has a local bias, but it's nowhere near as strong as the locality bias on Facebook, in part because people use it exactly the way that you're talking about. They use it as a way to look for other people in the network that they might end up paying attention to. And so for me in my work, I actually do a lot of experimentation with Twitter 
because I think Twitter's a really fun way to find the bridge figures. And for me, the bridge figures are people who I can understand, I've got enough in common with that I can read their language, I understand some of their cultural context, but they are knowledgeable about a topic or a place or perspective that I know very little about. And so one of my pieces of research in the long term is trying to figure out, can you use a network like Twitter to start identifying those sorts of bridge figures, people who will help you sort of get in other directions? Where we've done some research on this, on actual Twitter usage, one of my students, Nathan Matias, has built a set of tools that are pretty good at sort of sussing out gender online they look at someone's name and they make a pretty good guess based on first name of someone's gender. And they're going to be wrong a lot in individual instances, but in the aggregate, they're about 85% right. And what's interesting is you throw this on your own Twitter behavior. You can try this out. He's got a tool called Follow Bias. And I find that most people who look at who they follow on Twitter, they discover they're following many, many, many more men than women. And for people who are following more women than men, they tend to be separating their Twitter usage into a professional and into a personal account. But I, when I go out and give talks on this, I actually show my own data. And it turns out that I'm about 53% men, which doesn't sound too bad until you discover that that actually means 26% women, because there's 20 odd percent of sort of brands and bots within there. It's about two to one male to female. And so I think Twitter is absolutely moving us in sort of more diverse directions than something like Facebook. I think it's a huge upgrade. I think it's, it's, it's a wonderful network that I'm building on top of. But when I look at my own behavior on it, as well as other people on it, I have all sorts of biases that I'm really uncomfortable with. And so a lot of the work that I'm doing is sort of trying to build mirrors and tools to let people sort of look at those biases. And so we're thinking about things like, how do you build a Twitter recommendation system that lets you nudge it in one direction or another. That sort of says, I want more women in Twitter, so push me in that direction. Or one of my students is working on something right now called Terra Incognita, which sort of sits and looks where in the world she's paying attention to, and then starts nudging her to pay attention to parts of the world that she hasn't seen that week. So if she has an Asia-free week, might then start looking for someone on Twitter or looking for someone in media to sort of push in that direction. But the core question, which is what are those assumptions that go into the tool and how do they shape the behavior, I, I think you're right on. And I think looking at those two networks actually pushes in very, very different directions. But I think you have to look at the data, not just at sort of the anecdote, and then you start finding some of the more uncomfortable patterns. Can I just, I'm just before I'm going to come back right here, but I just wanted to follow up on the last two uh, questions, put them together a little bit. Um, I, in one of our colleagues here at the Open Society Foundations, or a group of them, organized uh, a meeting um, of journalists. Um, in, a meeting was held in Hong Kong, but it was Chinese, mainland Chinese journalists and African journalists, and they were talking about the coverage of Africa in China. Um, and if you were thinking of the qu question of bridge, uh, bridge makers um, uh, in, in your frame, um, this was not an internet discussion. It was an old media, traditional media conversation. But the point was made that when the BBC was trying to introduce Africa to its viewers, um, they, as you said a moment ago, flew in a British correspondent, landed in Africa, and reported from an African location. Um, and it was a long time before the BBC let the first African be the on-air presenter um, about Africa, from Africa, for, a, for the, their domestic audience. The Chinese jumped right over that and actually contracted uh, with Kenyan and other, other domestic um, uh, essentially subcontractors to produce news and broadcast news, including the on-air piece. Now, the argument would be uh, that actually the BBC was trying to bridge. They were trying to help their readers understand something foreign in a way that they could, as you were just saying in your search for a Twitter, you were looking, a, a, a Twitter um, friend, you were looking for someone who was close enough that you could understand them, but also far enough away that you'd learn something new. Um, that balance, of course, isn't new, is the story in China, but, but people can experiment with different things. You have to have a hypothesis somewhere about how close that bridge has to be. I think at that first meeting where we met, someone was telling a story about being a foreign correspondent in Afghanistan very early um, in the U.S.-NATO um, war there, um, and talking about how they went there and they needed to write stories about 
this Kansas City entrepreneur who went to Afghanistan and opened a hot dog stand um, because that would get their readers paying attention um, in a way Afghanistan didn't. Those are all bridge techniques. You have to have a theory um, uh, about what it takes to bridge yep. in addition to a technology that allows you to do it. And I just wondered if you wanted to say something about that. So th the theory that I... Do, do you want to build on that? or but yeah, Sure, go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, yeah, so it's an elaboration on that question. I had a second question, but I'll leave that. That's not so important. So, I mean, I was thinking about this, this issue of birds of a feather and flocking together. So on the one hand, you have to bridge, but on the other hand, you have to have this difference. So I, you know, I was trying to sort of imagine. On the one hand, you could say, well, we could have nothing in common. So I just find a random. I click on the internet, and I get a random site. But that's going to be a very inefficient way to find anything out. So we have to have this this bridge, as you said. Um, and so I was thinking, okay, well, what are meaningful bridges, and what are what are the bridges that we like, and what are the bridges that we don't like? So we don't like them if we went to high school with them. If we sort of follow on from this very limited talk of yours, we don't like them if they went to high school with you, but we do like them if they were from another country or were in my dorm room from another, you know, another faculty or something like that. Um, and the things you've sort of gravitated back to are geography, culture, and language. And the latter two can be really subsumed by the former. Um, so, I mean, what I was trying to think of sort of a space of people who are like and not like. And what are the ones we do and don't like? So is it about, you know, politics? Is it religion? Is it language? Is it culture? Which ones matter most? Or is it about having less in common than we have that's not in common? Um, and I don't mean to just sort of be too detailed about this, but I think if we're trying to build an infrastructure into the internet that lets us do this, knowing that we want to link people across political spectra or across geography or across religion or language, then we, you know, we can make really meaningful strides in that. So what is it acceptable to be in common and what is desirable to have not in common, I suppose? Um, okay, so my, my argument in the book tends to center on language and geography in part because there's a whole lot of really good scholarship done on politics in the United States. And so to the extent that I'm sort of following other scholars in this field, there's been an enormous amount done on sort of ideological isolation between the left and the right in the US. Uh, Cass Sunstein has a couple of remarkable books looking at the phenomenon of echo chambers. Eli Pariser has a very helpful book called The Filter Bubble, sort of looking at this question of how algorithms contribute to ideological isolation. To the extent that I've tried to go after that, I've been trying to make the argument that that filter bubble is three-dimensional, that it's not just about that the left and the right in the US don't talk to one another, but there's all sorts of obstacles that make it difficult for people of different faiths, different languages, different nationalities to talk to one another. And because I end up using the language of cosmopolitanism, which tends to be specifically about cross-nation, that does give it that particular lens. And so I apologize if I'm losing you on that, but that, that is where that focus comes in. I, I'm also not trying to be, I, obviously I'm trying to be prescriptive, but I'm also not trying to give you a formula of please meet this many people of another religion and this many from another political party. What I'm actually trying to make a larger case about is that there is enormous value, and the book actually looks at some of the research on this, in having a circle of people that you are interacting with who come from a different background because they're bringing different cognitive tools to the table. And so really what the book is about is trying to figure out how you expand that toolkit that you're bringing to problems and you're bringing to issues by looking at a more diverse range of people. Where I'm going after that is through, as Chris was asking, this question of bridging and, and how do you pay attention to people and issues in sort of other parts of the world or in other ideologies or in your community who you're not reaching out to who are somehow absent from your media picture. Chris puts forward this really interesting dichotomy, right? You've got Chinese news networks essentially saying, we're going to go straight to the Kenyans and, you know, who cares whether Daily Nation in Kenya has ever met a Chinese person? We're going to produce Kenyan TV for, for Chinese and it's all going to work out. And, and my guess is that it's actually not going to work very well for a while. Um, the British version of this essentially says, Brits won't pay attention to a Kenyan. We're going to put Brits in Kenya for... Uh, three, four generations, and then maybe we'll get to the point where a Kenyan will be able to talk to a British audience. That's also problematic, right? So the hope is that there's a middle ground in here somewhere. And the argument that I try to make is that bridge figures are people who metaphorically have feet in both worlds. They are almost always people who have 
traveled and been educated in another place, or at least have worked in another place for a long period of time. They're people who have split allegiances. So it might be someone in Kenya who's also spent a decent amount of time in China. It might be someone from China who's gone and worked and studied and had some time in Kenya. But the notion is that you understand something about what are the cultural assumptions, what is the background you would need to understand a complex issue. And that you can then bring that into the process of the communication behind it. And this is very much what we've ended up doing in Global Voices. We've got 1,500 people who are sort of engaged in the day-to-day -day business of saying, this is what's being talked about in Pakistan right now. And we're going to assume that the audience is not just Pakistani because it's a global audience that we're sort of going for. So you start looking for people who have spent substantial amount of time both in Pakistan and one of other nations, and then start looking for that question of what do I have to explain to unpack this for a different audience? That's where the bridging piece of this sort of ends up coming into play. And so I, I don't think the solution is the Chinese solution of just sort of saying, let's get the local newsroom. I think that's where you want to get to in the long run. But I suspect that what they're actually going to have to do is much more what Jazeera is doing, which is doing this, I, I think, quite a bit more responsibly, which is they're bringing a lot of reporters into Doha for rotations, for ships, building on Al Jazeera English and such, then coming out and building local newsrooms through a combination of reporters who reported internationally and reporters who are reporting locally. I think this is a space, that question of cultural translation and bridging, that we've not explored particularly well. I think it's something that when you talk to people who build transnational teams or who build transnational media, will often tell you is utterly essential, is a key part of what they do. But I don't think we have a ton of language around it. And so in the book, I try to intru introduce language around bridges and language around xenophiles, which are sort of the parallel of people who are looking for cognitive diversity in their communities, in the broader world, are looking for difference and are therefore people who bridge figures can reach out to the one factor or another. But I'm putting this out mostly because I'm hoping that we can have sort of a richer dialogue or debate about it, not because I necessarily think I have the answers to, to solving these questions of bridging. Thank you. My name is Mark Gavigan. To a great extent, we have the, the internet that we have chosen. We vote with our eyeballs, we vote with our clicks, we vote with our time. So how do you change demand? How do you rewire the average person on the street so that they are really interested in what's going on, so that they have an interest in cultural and cognitive diversity? So this question of voting with our eyes and voting with our clicks was was where I was trying to go responding to the gentleman who was asking about surveillance, which is we've had a very small number of people moving to highly secure email and moving to Tor and sort of supporting those projects, which to me unfortunately suggests that, that, that I wish they were voting more with their feet. And I think similarly, I've had the problem with Global Voices. I've been running a website for 10 years essentially saying, hey, if you'll let us, we would love to tell you what's going on in Bolivia or Bangladesh. And we have not had the audience that we have really hoped to have. And so I, I think this question of how you would sort of change demand, I think you would have to start by sort of pointing out what some of the problems are when you do end up in these echo chambers of one fashion or another. And the argument that, that Sunstein ends up making is that it tends to make us more extreme that when we look at things only from a left point of view or only from a US point of view or only from a Christian point of view or whatever chamber you want to think about, when we talk with people who've self-selected into that same group, we tend to get more extreme in our views. Um, and I worry that this is happening even at a moment where not only is there the potential to understand what someone else is saying and what someone else is thinking, but enormous need to do so. A lot of the problems that we would like to address at this moment in time demand some sort of a transnational approach to them. You're probably not going to take on climate change in a meaningful way one country at a time. Uh, you're probably not even going to take on you know, global diseases like malaria, even if you're the Gates Foundation, unless you're actually working with communities on the ground and having real communication about where you go with this. So I think it's critically important that we start wrestling with this question 
of whether we are or are not sort of getting that more diverse view or whether we're sort of following into homophily traps of one fashion or another. So my hope was to make the case that you would be a better, smarter, more creative, et cetera, person with more cognitive diversity in your life. Whether or not I'm going to succeed in making that case, and further on from that, whether anyone is going to take the next steps and try to figure out how we start going after the tools to make that possible, I have only limited control over that. Uh, I have limited control over my own grad students, maybe half of whom seem to be working on tools you know, coming out of the book, and another half of them have sort of said, no, thank you, this is not actually what I'm particularly interested in. Um, I think what's hard about this, almost every time I give a talk on this book, someone says, all right, I'm excited, I buy it, what do I do to change my behavior? And the answer is, as an individual, there are very few things you can do, because actually a lot of this is about systems. It's about the system of the press, which is very good at paying attention to a small number of important company, uh, countries at the expense of a large number of countries that are unimportant until they suddenly mysteriously become important when Tunisia suddenly overthrows a dictator and everybody goes, oh, the Arab world doesn't work the way we thought it did. Um, and, and that, I think, should be evidence that there are some systemic problems that need to be addressed with how the press works. And where the book is really trying to go is essentially say, here are things you'd want to try to fix in the press, and here are things that you'd want to try to fix on the net. In the press, you would want to try to find a way to be very conscious of where you're looking and where you're not looking, and think about how to provide light and insight and connection in those dark spots in the map, probably through identifying those bridges. On the net side of this, you would want to think about these questions of what assumptions we've baked in that you mostly want to hear from people who are similar to you and who view the world the same way, and start thinking about, essentially, how do you put a risk knob? How do you essentially say, today is a day where I'm comfortable with Facebook being a warm bath, but you know what, tomorrow I'm actually psyched to be sort of pulled out of my orbit here. And if you can find me someone who's interested in some of the things that I care about, but it's very different for me on any number of different axes, whether it's that they're a Republican or, or that they're Muslim or, or that they're from Botswana. I think thinking about that question of how we move from a sort of one-size-fits-all, low-risk internet to a significantly riskier internet sort of based on this idea of connecting broadly, that, that's where I'd sort of want to go with some of those ideas. Let's go back. I want to... You know, sometimes the problems we're dealing with on the net have been uh, dealt with in other media as well. Hi. Uh, I'm Paco Dionis from Skylight Pictures. And, uh, you know, speaking of assumptions, uh, one of the big assumptions, obviously, is to monetize the net and, uh, you know, that these companies have to make a lot of money. They also uh, control, in many ways, what we can communicate. Uh, we put out a, an occasional newsletter and... Recently, the subject line of uh, one of our newsletters was naked impunity in Guatemala. That ended up tagging us as spammers because the word naked was in the, ta you know, in the subject line. So there's this sort of insidious um, control by uh, private corporations over what is uh, acceptable and what isn't. So I, <clears throat> I'm just wondering if uh, at MIT Media Lab or in other... Uh, you know, internet think tanks, let's say, uh, there's any thought about a, the equivalent of the public broadcasting system for an, there's a Facebook uh, equivalent uh, or a Google equivalent, but it's, that it's pub, truly public. It's a great question. Um, the person who's doing the best work on this is my, my colleague and dear friend, Rebecca McKinnon, uh, who wrote a very thoughtful book called Consent of the Networked which looks at this question of what happens when you discover that your private provider isn't letting you say what you want to say. Um, and she is now working at uh, Penn Annenberg trying to come up with an index of basically saying, like, who's good about this and who's bad about this? Mm -hmm. So it turns out Twitter's really good about this, historically. You go to Twitter and you sort of say, uh, I don't like what this person's saying, take it down. Even, by the way, sometimes when you have good reasons. I went to Twitter at one point and said, here is someone in Nigeria urging Muslims to rise up and kill Christians. Do you think you might want to take this down? At which point, Katie Stannon from Twitter came back and said, no, not going to pull that down. 
Uh, we're going to call more attention to it if we pull that down. And besides, as you know, our goal here is to provide that open platform for speech. You're going to have the Streisand effect. You're going to have too many people paying attention to it. So no way are we going to bend our policies on this, despite the fact that we understand why you're trying to make this case. But good stuff, you know, for the most part. Facebook, traditionally, has been terrible about this, absolutely dreadful about this, took down uh, several important pages uh, towards organizing the revolutions in Egypt based on the fact that people were working under pseudonyms to have those pages. And in fact, the reason they were working under pseudonyms was so they didn't lose their jobs or get arrested by the government. And Facebook, despite many, 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 many inquiries, hasn't moved away from a real name policy. So there's a whole spectrum of this as far as corporate behavior. And one of the big things we can do is try to figure out how do we reward good behavior? How do we punish bad behavior? How do we make that more transparent? Now, the larger question of this, which is how do you build a public version of this, is really hard. And the reason it's really hard is since the mid-1990s, it's corporations all the way down. So even if you're getting good behavior from your Facebook or your Twitter, you might not have good behavior from the internet service provider, from the hosting provider, from the DNS provider, from the people who run the cables. And the way to understand this is to look at what's happened to WikiLeaks. And WikiLeaks ultimately has gotten punished at sort of every layer of the stack. They've had hosts pull service. They've had ISPs pull service. They've had domain name registrars pull service. Ultimately, where they've been most hurt is that payment processors have pulled service. Can you build an internet completely independent of corporate structure? Possibly, maybe. Eben Moglen is trying something that he calls Freedom Box, but to me it requires enormous suspension of disbelief because what it really comes down to is you are plugging into an electric network and plugging into an internet network and then creating a mesh network on top of it. So it's a cute trick that you've got sort of decentralized fire hosting, but at the end of it you're still dealing with cables owned by corporations. I think there's actually probably more power here in building highly ethically rooted, very transparent businesses that compete based on saying, we're going to do this right, we're going to disclose what we do, and we're willing to take the punishment if we screw it up. I think there's enormous market opportunity for someone to show up and say, we are not Gmail, we do not have a backdoor to the NSA. If we are forced to make a backdoor to the NSA, we will shut the service rather than doing it and that we're going to put encryption from your machine to the server so that we can't do it anyway. And I'm hoping that's the case. I am skeptical because I haven't seen people stepping up for that demand yet, but I'm very much hoping that that's the case, not just around privacy, but also around this question of the network public sphere. So we're going to go one more question here, and then we're going to um, come to a close. Hi, I'm Mike, and I have a follow-up to the Twitter question. It seemed like you were saying that there is more uh, cognitive diversity in Twitter versus Facebook. So if that's the case, are you seeing some of the results you were hoping to see from having that diversity? And do you have any specific examples of that? So I'm going to rephrase slightly differently and say, I think that the way a lot of people are using Twitter makes it more likely that they're going to expose to cognitive diversity than how people are using Facebook. And I would say that the main way that I would sort of point to that in terms of anecdotal evidence is looking at how journalists are using the two networks. Journalists are not, generally speaking, spending a ton of time on Facebook looking for sources on stories. And the reason for that is that Facebook, while it claims that you're connected to everyone in the world through four and a half people, it's really hard to get through those four and a half people. It's very hard to sort of say, uh, hi, my friends in Western Massachusetts, any of you happen to know someone in Sudan who I can interview for this piece and get there in four hops? It's a whole lot easier to do it on Twitter where you can search, where you can follow blindly, where you can start looking for people who are within those networks. And I would say that if you can look at the coverage through the Arab Spring, Twitter has ended up being quite critical to people trying to figure out how they find those voices. It's also been quite critical for bridges. And you've seen people like Andy Carvin working with Ahmed Al-Omran at NPR, finding a way to sort of curate Twitter flows to give some perspective on what was going on in Libya that was actually very difficult to get because it was so difficult for journalists to get there onto the ground. Uh, 
So for me, it's pretty good evidence that it, it's pushing in a slightly different direction. I'm actually really encouraged by the fact that Vivian Schiller uh, is announcing that she's heading there as their head of news. Uh, and that's someone who had, a, I, I thought, quite a positive influence at NPR, I thought was doing some interesting things at NBC. I have high hopes that Twitter sees that as sort of part of their mission going forward. I don't know that they do. And now that they're going to be subject to public market pressure and to advertising pressure, it's possible they're going to move in a different way. But you can keep your fingers crossed. Yeah. <clears throat> the... Uh... Uh, it seems to me that we've been having a couple of different conversations. There's one conversation that your last comments are about, which is how do you how do you do it? How do we use the tools we've got now with the limitations that we and others have built into them to do the other project, to see more, to see farther, to connect um, and learn in, in, in less comfortable um, ways. The other conversation we've been having is how can we imagine um, motivating, encouraging people to want more. Um, and that's where the bridge, the bridges come. Um, I think w uh, some of the documentary filmmakers in the room taught me once that you can't make a documentary about a really important topic unless you put a person with a story in the middle of it. And uh, the, uh, not the only way, but one way to make it work. And in some ways, that's a, a story about your bridge, about um, a, a story, a narrative can be a bridge, a person can be a bridge. And thinking about how we use the tools we have um, uh, to encourage others to want more uh, from the Internet is the other, other part of the conversation. Um, I'll end with just one question we got from the, uh, from the web, which is you end your um, uh, end of book, and near the end of the book you talk about um, the difference between prediction and prophecy. Um, you want to leave us with one? You can pick either one, a prediction or a prophecy. Well, I... I, I use those words um, in a very specific way. I, I end up arguing that, that prophecy isn't, isn't telling the future. Prophecy uh, is, is hoping for fundamental change and trying to bring that, that change into being. Um, you know, so for me, the prophecy is that there are people who deeply want the Internet to be a space where people connect across all sorts of differences. And it's my prophecy, not necessarily my prediction, um, that these people are going to be the next generation of people building tools because we've gone really, really far down one path. And it's been a really interesting path, but it's not as interesting as it used to be. And to me, the really interesting stuff now um, is, is the use of the internet that pulls us towards the unfamiliar, that pulls us towards the different that helps us not just sort of find out about the rest of the world, but really change what we want to know about the rest of the world. So, so that, that's my prophecy. Thanks, and thanks for writing the book, and thanks for being here tonight. Thanks so much, Chris. Thanks for having me.